Okay, I've got, uh, I've got 10 after the hour, so let's get started. Can you hear me in the back row? I hope we don't have another day like we had last Wednesday and it was blistering in here. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so uh, uh, today we're moving on to Emily Dickinson, who lived from 1830 till 1886. Uh, her life, uh, like Whitman's, spans the 19th century, though not, uh, not, not as long. And like many readers, I, I want to see her uh, with Whitman as a precursor of modernism, of the moderns, uh, but with a distinction, uh, because Dickinson is a kind of temperamental and stylistic opposite of Whitman, who, uh, with his barbaric yawp, is loud, outspoken, all-containing. I contain multitudes, he says. Uh, and Dickinson, by contrast, is uh, aloof and uh, delicate, elusive, uh, web-like, frail. Uh, uh, her whole world takes place in very small spaces, uh, in her room, uh, to which she retreated uh, toward the end of her life. And uh, those of you who have taken 45A may recall that the Italian, one, one Italian room for word, uh, one Italian word for a room is stanza, no chalk. Uh, Stanza is the Italian uh, word for room, uh, and she exploits this in her poetry. And a number of the poems you read uh, have to do with dancing and walking, too, and of course poetry is measured in feet. So if you think about somebody ambulating in a room, it's like working with feet in a stanza. Uh, her existence in a room is a kind of poetry. Then outside of her room, there's the world of the garden and nature, uh, and uh, the town of Amherst. Uh, but these sp small spaces, like her poems, contain uh, uh, virtually everything. Uh, we have that poem number 632 in the anthology on page 38 uh, saying the brain is wider than the sky because inside this little space the whole sky will fit and much more too. Uh, Dickinson was a writer from the start of her life. Uh, uh, in 1850 at the age of 20 uh, she uh, published her first work in a college newspaper, the Amherst Indicator. Uh, she wrote a valentine to a friend who was a writer um, uh, who uh, decided he would publish it, and he published it along with a note wondering who the author was and praising her for, quote, her power to cast spells, quicken the imagination, and cause blood to run fro frolic through the veins. Uh, so it was a prophetic occasion and prophetic remarks, uh, and also, uh, uh, unfortunately, one of the few critical responses that Dickinson got in her life. Uh, after that unsought college publication, uh, uh, 40 years pass, uh, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, very few publications. Uh, when she was 31 uh, in 1866, she sent uh, 40 poems and 30 letters to a guy named Samuel Bowles, who's the editor of a local newspaper, the Springfield Daily Republican, and he published about 12 of them. Those are the only poems she published in her life. Then about five years later, she wrote a letter to a, uh, the editor of the Atlantic Monthly at the time, a guy named Thomas Higginson. One of the letters is one of the handouts I passed out to you. Um, asking for advice to a young writer. Um, he, he was uh, encouraging to males, not so much to females. Uh, and they, 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 they started up a 24 year, co year correspondence uh, in which he advises, advised, her, uh, advised her not to uh, uh, publish uh, while she was working at her style, which he regarded as spasmodic, wild, and uncontrolled. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at some reasons for this uh, in a while. Uh, <coughs> And then uh, in 1890, in November of 1890, uh, four years after her death, uh, a neighbor of hers with whom she was friendly, um, uh, Mabel Loomis Todd, and uh, Higginson, the editor of The Atlantic, he had underwent a change of heart, and they uh, persuaded a publisher in Boston to bring out a volume of her poems. 116 of the poems were published out of, out of 1,775 that she left when she died. And within two years, this book went through 11 editions. Uh, it, it made a smash and obviously spoke to something in the American sensibility. One of the first reviewers, among many who praised her, uh, said, uh, there's hardly a line that fails to throw off a gleam of genuine original power of imagination, of real emotional thought. But at the same time, he said, and here's a, the complaint about technical imperfection again, there is not a stanza that cannot be objected to on the score of technical imperfection. It, what he's referring to is uh, uh, the unorthodox punctuation and uh, the syntax. Uh, look at the soul selects her own society on page 35. Um, and uh, uh, just the, the, the way that words are separated by dashes uh, caused some perturbation. Uh, but uh, this unorthodox kind of writing, which we're gonna, I'm going to dissect uh, before the hour is over, uh, is analogous to the kind of, it's half barbaric, it's a new species of, uh, of art. Uh, and I'll recall, rec recall that Emerson said uh, uh, of, of Whitman, it's not meter, but meter making argument that makes a poem, a thought so passionate and alive that, like the spirit of a plant, 
or an animal. It has an architecture of its own and adorns nature with a new thing. So only 12 poems in her life uh, she didn't publish. And uh, unlike Whitman, whose poem got bigger and bigger and took on more and more, her, uh, she tended to do the opposite and to compress and make her poems more and more concise and tight. Um, her family was well-to-do and supportive, and they did everything they could for her except understand her, as she put it. She was too far out there for them. Um, the gr the gr grandfather uh, was one of the founders of Amherst College and a prominent lawyer, civic leader, church leader. And the father, too, uh, was a treasurer for Amherst College and um, a, a loyal churchman and a lawyer. Uh, all of them were into business and civic uh, civicism. Um, the f so the family was supportive but disconnected. Um, the letter I passed out uh, gives you her life in a nutshell. And in the last paragraph, she says, I have a brother and sister. My mother does not care for thought. And father, too busy with his briefs to notice what we do. He buys me many books, but begs me not to read them because he fears they joggle the mind. They are religious except me and address an eclipse every morning whom they call our father. Uh, but I fear my story fatigues you. I would like to learn. Could you tell me how to grow, or is it unconveyed like melody or witchcraft? Now, look at the way this, the sentences end up with dashes, too. Uh, could you tell me how to grow? What's she saying here? Uh, the, uh, the syntax gets a little uh, unorganized and uh, uh, gives us a clue to what, what uh, some people objected to in the poetry. Um, but the, the, the letter is telling, and it tells us the mother doesn't like thinking, and the father distrusts uh, literature, too busy with his briefs. Um, her main family allies were her brother Austin, who was three years older, uh, an avid reader, an intellectual companion and competitor, uh, who eventually went off to Boston and got married. Uh, and she had a devoted sister, Lavinny, Vinny, uh, of whom she said, it's like we came from two different worlds. Uh, they couldn't talk about anything because Vinny was into like domestic work, pie baking and, and housekeeping and stuff. Uh, the family also had a daily prayer devotion in the morning. Uh, when uh, when uh, Dickinson died, somebody discovered there were 19 Bibles in the house. Um, which uh, Dickinson made fun of these prayer ceremonies. She, uh, she, she calls God the Father the, a big eclipse in this letter. Um, and her father, she said, uh, he seems like an old, old kind of foreigner. Uh, they, they just lived in different worlds. Um, she had some enamorments in her life. In, in the letter, she mentions uh, a father's apprentice uh, who was a kind of intellectual companion. This is probably Benjamin Franklin Newton, uh, who was nine years older and came to study law with her father. On the name Benjamin Franklin Newton, I just want to digress and point out that Whit in Whitman's nine siblings, he had four brothers called, three brothers called George Washington Whitman, Thomas Jefferson Whitman, and Andrew Jackson Whitman. Um, <laughs> early America. Um, so Benjamin Franklin Newton spent some time with uh, uh, Dickinson. She called her, uh, he was her literary and, and spiritual tutor and preceptor. Uh, he eventually moved away. Um, they corresponded for a while. He sent her a, a copy of Emerson's poems. Emerson actually came to Amherst and talked while Dickinson was alive, so she would have heard him. The head note to the uh, Norton Anthology tells you that she heard of Whitman but didn't read him because he was, uh, by reputation, disgraceful. Um, she had a second uh, kind of love interest, uh, uh, another tutor for her father. Uh, the, the guy eventually came out here to San Francisco, and she lost track of him. Uh, but if you think that she was a prude, uh, read poem number, 30, uh, number 249 on page 33. Maybe I'll get to it. Uh, Wild Nights. Uh, uh, she, it's a poem that uh, asks to spend wild nights in luxury. And luxury is, of course, a, a homonym for lechery. Luxury, lechery. Um, and the poem ends up with a kind of prayer that I could moor inside of you. Uh, so read it the way you want to. Uh, if we have time, I'll get back to it. Uh, as she got older, she uh, retreated more and more to her second story room, her stanza and kept to herself. Uh, as Vinnie said, she had to think. She was the only one of us who had to do that. And at the age of 30, for obscure reasons, she stopped going to church. Uh, some speculation is that she felt a dis distaste for the concept of original sin, that innocent babies are born like stained and, and sinful, uh, or a distaste for like the uh, august sublimity called the eclipse in the letter. But her uh, uh, withdrawal from church distanced her even further from her family and also from their community. Uh, gradually, she lost contact with neighbors and friends and uh, ended up with a small circle of friends. Uh, she withdrew, uh, not for lack of love and aff affection, obviously, uh, but because she had work to do. Uh, and she wouldn't kowtow with the publishers and critics. Uh, despite Higginson's advice for her not to publish, she went ahead and kept on writing. It says good things about her family that they took her uh, uh, reclusiveness in stride. There were no fights or recriminations. Uh, that was the way she was. And on her part, she wrote of them with affection. Uh, so uh, Vinnie, Vinnie writes, uh, we all lived like absolute monarchs, each in his own domain, each in his own room. So uh, Dickinson, I think, offers us a different kind of vision of American independence and freedom. Um, 
it's not the kind of freedom that comes as in Whitman with uh, uh, taking to the open road and having more and more experiences and embracing more and more opportunities and containing multitudes. Uh, Dickinson discovers freedom inside. Um, uh, <clears throat> one of the brother's recriminations was that uh, uh, nobody in the family comprehended her because she had gone really deep inside in places where the rest of the family uh, couldn't. Um, and her personal style comes across in her poems, which are, uh, like her as a sensibility, frail looking, uh, frail appearing, uh, wispy and delicate and web light and slight, uh, uh, yet they're way out there and powerful and deep. Uh, uh, practicing, with the last word in that letter I handed that is witchcraft, uh, a kind of witchcraft. Uh, and they, uh, they attain their power because she has this penchant for, uh, as it's put in the last poem in the anthology, telling it slant, uh, which is operating in riddles and puns and diddy dizzyingly bottomless enigmas. So let's look at that poem, number 1129, on page 40 of your anthology. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise is lightning to the children ease with explanation kind. The truth must gra dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Um, this is a hard poem to read because of the syntax. It's hard to know how the words connect, uh, which may be its first uh, mystery. The poem works in the way that its key terms indicate, uh, that is by indirection uh, or slantedness, uh, by circling around a topic or concern that's moving in circuits, uh, in circles, um, rather than uh, uh, just stating some things uh, uh, straightforwardly. It pulls you in by way of the statement made in the first two lines, and then it stumps you. Uh, and uh, it does so because Dickin Dickinson evolved or invented her own system of punctuation, uh, uh, a weird system of punctuation that's full of dashes of different lengths and commas and spacing. Uh, nobody knows what it means. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why she was charged by critics with being uh, uh, sp uh, spasmodic and technically imperfect. Uh, um, Recently, uh, readers have argued that what she's doing is inventing a kind of language that resists patriarchy and that's uh, uh, feministic. Uh, 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 let me say, to begin with, that what you're reading uh, in the anthology is, first of all, somebody's interpretation of Dickinson. Uh, she's been reduced and made less interesting than she might be. One of the things I passed around is a manuscript page from her, uh, of her poems, uh, this sheet. Uh, <coughs> and if you uh, decipher her penmanship, you'll see that the poem on the left-hand page is poem number 754, uh, which appears on page 39, My Life Had Stood, A Loaded Gun. And the uh, poem on the right-hand page is a, uh, her manuscript version of The Soul Selects Her Own Society, poem number 303, which is on page uh, 35. Uh, take a look at page 35 in The Soul Selects Her Own Society, and let's compare it to this. Uh, this uh, uh, so. Uh, in the uh, anthology, there's a dash at the end of the first line, as indeed there is in her manuscript. But after the soul selects, uh, there's a, there seems to be something that's a dash, and that's not included in the poem. Why not? Um, and then look at the, uh, the way the poem in the anthology is printed. The last line of this poem, like stone, ends with a dash. But in the manuscript, it looks like a period. And then notice that uh, in, in the second line, the editor doesn't include the dashes that appear after. Is that a dash after then shuts? and the, are those dashes or are they accent marks? And then there are two plus signs in front of the, the last four lines. Uh, nobody knows what those mean, so those aren't replicated in the, uh, in the version you've got. So the editor has taken out uh, a lot of these marks, which might be very significant for all we know. Um, <coughs> some readers have think, think that they're not, uh, not dashes, but uh, instead marks that indicate like we're rhetorical emphasis to be, uh, 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 to be laid. Uh, and also the dashes are not all the same length, so that they mean the same thing to Dickinson. And then uh, notice also while you're looking at the manuscripts, the spacing of letters and words. Uh, uh, sometimes the words are far apart as if they're like independent from each other. They have to be examined separately. So I want to start thinking about our poetry as uh, like Whitman's, uh, uh, a union of independent states. Uh, these little words and, and lines and, uh, and uh, word installations and constructions that are put together and united uh, through the construction of a poem. So if you're going to become a Dickinson scholar, uh, the standard work uh, by B.W. Franklin includes uh, uh, volume one is the manuscript poems uh, typed out, and volume two is a variorum, which gives all the kind of variations of the poems the editors have gotten. And the third volume is a facsimile of the poems, because if you're going to really work with Dickinson, you have to look at her manuscripts uh, and decide what these marks mean. Dashes, uh, moreover, uh, 
uh, which is what all these marks get reduced to in the print, uh, uh, are the loosest unit of punctuation in English. Uh, they make very loose connections. So um, look at poem 657 on page 38, um, uh, lines 9 to 10. Uh, of visitors, the fairest, for occupation this, the spreading wide my narrow hands together, paradise. What's the relation of all these, all these words? And do they fit together syntactically or are they just kind of like held up to, uh, uh, to each other? Uh, <coughs> uh, all these words are united and joined, but they're also operating independently. So uh, in this poem, what are, what are we to make of lines three to six? The first two lines seem fairly straightforward. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant, success and circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise is lightning to the children eased with explanation kind. It doesn't help that there are no commas or, or periods to uh, separate the words. Uh, uh, what's too bright for our infirm delight in line three? Um, when you first read the poem and come out of line two, success lies, uh, too bright for our infirm delight. It seems like it's the object of the verb lies, um, which of course makes a, a, a contrast, the word lies makes a contrast with the word truth. Uh, and when we get to the fourth line, uh, the truth is a superb surprise, we realize retrospectively that what's too bright for our infirm delight is the truth surprise. Uh, but uh, notice that we have to circle back to get the meaning. So the poem is kind of like illustrating what it means. Uh, it's it's uh, only after we make a mistake uh, do we realize that we're not too bright and we've missed the truth. Uh, we have to return to it. Uh, note to the play on words, uh, bright and delight. Uh, People who think they know it all uh, are really blind. Uh, they are delighted. Uh, delight can mean the, the taking away of light. Uh, uh, it means, of course, enrapture or make happy, but it's the uh, denial of light, to take light away. And now as we go through the poem, we'll notice a, a string of words that are related conceptually. Um, bright, delight, lightning, dazzle, blind, all of which suggests a progression and perhaps the experience of a, a lightning bolt uh, so, f so bright and uh, powerful that it, it renders you blind. And of course, there's a, 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 a narrative history of this, this kind of uh, phenomenon too. Uh, I think uh, notably of St. Paul, uh, then Saul on the road to Damascus, uh, anti-Christian who's uh, blinded by God and is suddenly enlightened to the truth. Um, so the metaphor starts to invoke paradoxes that are uh, uh, a common in the mystic tradition uh, in, in which conversion is a process in which you're blinded in order to be able to see, in order to get insight, you have to be blinded. Um, and the idea is that meaning emerges gradually through indirect circuitry uh, growing deeper as we uh, 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 gain access uh, uh, to this poem and as uh, nuances uh, and weights reveal themselves. If you can see the mean, uh, meaning immediately, uh, uh, what you see is, tr is trivial. Uh, to tell things straight out is trivial. Um, uh, you're blind to it uh, if you think you can see it right away. Um, I'm thinking now of the Saddleback, uh, uh, the Saddleback uh, Forum and the question like, when does life begin? Is there an easy answer to that question? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the poem works, I, I suppose, like the experience of Saul on the road to Damascus. Where it gives us a, a, a verbal texture that's riddling, this telling its slant and figures uh, in enigmas. It's an aspect of Dickinson's style. Um, and it's one that draws on the Bible, too. Um, we go back to, to Whitman now, who draws on the Bible because it's an epic of creation. Uh, Dickinson's work draws on, on 19th century Protestantism, hymns, uh, and secular versions of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> But uh, Dickinson, Dickinson's poems work quite differently by asking you to uh, guess what I mean. Uh, and that makes you as a reader an active force in the poem. You have to participate in it and kind of outpsych her uh, to get to where she's going. So uh, she's also not making statements and yelling at you like Whitman or clobbering you over the head. Uh, these poems instead become like little constant in installations of words, each of which is separate and dis discrete, but all of which are unified, each of which ask you to stop and look and weigh and then go on as you circle round and round and put these uh, uh, resonances together. So let's look at another poem that uh, works by circuitry and by telling it slant uh, with another complex set of issues, but not before uh, noticing that the odd word slant um, reappears in poem 258 on page 34, there's a certain slant of light. And this is only to begin to notice that single words in Dickinson, slant, heft, um, reappear and make of these independent poems a kind of unit too. Uh, before moving on uh, away from this poem, to uh, note the wordplay that she gets by uh, 
in the opening lines, tell all the truth but tell it slant, uh, success and circuit lies. Uh, she's evoking the idea of like there being a, a legal, tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help you God. It's not always easy to do. And then she ends the first line with the word slant. Uh, uh, and everybody knows that you can slant the truth. And then the second line ends in the word lies. So the truth is seen to be a complex thing that can only be approached uh, maybe asymptotically by the kind of circus, circuitry that she makes available to us. I want to move next to a, a poem with a, a live object at its center, uh, poem 328 on page uh, 35, uh, A Bird Came Down the Walk. So did all of you read Dickinson in high school? So and there's a certain way of teaching Dickinson which comes across as like the purveyor of little moral nuggets, uh, which is not, not the kind of Dickinson that we're interested in now that you're all in college. Um, so I'll read this and then uh, talk about it. A bird came down the walk, he did not know I saw. He bit an angleworm in halves and ate the fellow raw. And then he drank a dew from a convenient grass and then hopped sideways to the wall to let a beetle pass. He glanced with rapid eyes that hurried all around. They looked like frightened beads, I thought. Uh, he stirred his velvet head like one in danger. Cautious, I offered him a crumb and he unrolled his feathers and rode him softer home. Then oars divide the ocean, too silver for a seam or butterflies off banks of noon leap plashless as they swim. So it, I mean, it seems really simple, on, simple and, and frail on the surface, but once you start to push this poem, it takes you into wild places. The opening lines uh, immediately introduce uh, what seems to me the enigmas and puzzles at the heart of the poem by raising the question, do birds or other animals know that you're supposed to walk on sidewalks, uh, uh, that you're supposed to wait for traffic lights, uh, that you're supposed to obey the rules and follow the straight and near, near, uh, narrow. What, what does it mean that a bird comes down the walk? Um, so this is the central tension of the poem, um, a tension between the categories and ideas that are available to the speaker. Those are terms which define human life um, and the categories that are relative to the bird which has no consciousness. Uh, uh, it does not know, as the second line tells us, a bird came down the walk, he did not know, I saw. That can mean two things. I saw, I, I, I observed that he did not know. He, he couldn't see it. He didn't know he was supposed to walk on the sidewalk. He knew nothing. Uh, but at the same time, it's saying he didn't know that I was looking. Uh, he did not know I saw because his eyes are all over the place. Uh, they look like frightened beads uh, hurrying all around. Uh, is the bird even ob observant? Uh, so the bird has no consciousness. Uh, uh, and then the tone starts to get uh, jarring and shocking. Uh, he bit an angle worm in halves and ate the fellow raw. Um, and uh, that partly humanizes the bird by connecting him to like human practice. Uh, uh, angle worm, the, the word angle starts to sound like England or English. Uh, and uh, ate the fellow, uh, uh, we're dealing with human beings here it, until you get to that word raw and then we start to realize this is a something like cannibalism. So the speaker has a hard time recognizing this, the, this bird outside of human categories. And then we get to the second stanza, he drank a dew from a convenient grass. Is it possible not to hear the word glass? Uh, nothing's more intense than slamming a dew. Uh, um, in the next description where the, uh, uh, the bird pauses to let a beetle pass suggests that it's got manners, um, an idea of social behavior, and so it again humanizes them. So uh, at the end of these considerations, part of what we're being asked in this poem is whether or not you ever see anything raw, uh, if you ever see nature uh, without human lines, uh, paths, and, and sidewalks, uh, uh, or rules there. Um, uh, <coughs> there's a, a contemporary philosopher named Baudrillard, no chalk, uh, B-A-U-D-R-I-L-L-A-R-D, who invents this term hyperreality to infer the, uh, refer to the world we live in. His argument is that everything is mediated for us. Everything that we know in the world comes to us through print or, uh, or film. Uh, has anybody been to Afghanistan? How do you know it's there? Uh, you've never really seen it. It's all, it comes to you by mediation. Baudrillard points out that before we go to the really wild places in the world, Yosemite, we've seen them so many times on, on TV or in books that when we get there, we know exactly where to look and how to frame things. It doesn't surprise us or shock us. So. Uh, because we almost never experience reality. Um, so the poem is fascinated by the ubiquity of mediation. Uh, nature is already kind of interpreted for us uh, uh, and made to look comfortable as if like these creatures out there behave like human beings, though we know they, they don't. Um, so uh, can we ever see anything outside of the uh, cultural forms and civilization? Uh, 
As, the, as Dickinson goes on to, to describe the birds, uh, his eyes look like frightened beads. I thought he stirred his velvet head. The terms start to dress him up, uh, beads, velvet. Um, the next thing we need to have a nice a woman's outfit is some feathers now, uh, beads, velvet, and feathers. And where, does, where do the feathers come from? Um, you know, violence is somewhere down at the bottom of this poem, too. Uh, 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 women don't go west like Whitman and carry shotguns, but uh, they need things killed in order to make their wider wardrobe as well. So at the end of this poem, uh, I think what we're seeing is the speaker just fails to make contact with this, uh, with this bird. As a human, he can't understand. And if in the first stanza, uh, the bird did not know uh, anything about like human rules or customs, in the last stanza, we're seeing the human beings don't know either. They don't know uh, what it is uh, to uh, be without consciousness, uh, not to be burdened with consciousness, uh, uh, and to have the kind of freedom of the bird. And the, the last image, I think, of the bird uh, uh, rowing him home, the word road now, uh, take the word path in the beginning turns into road here, and it reminds us of different ways of proceeding on land, along paths and in water where there are no paths. The human, humans follow paths and li follow lines, birds are pathless. Uh, the images of like jumping into water, which is maybe as close as we can know what it's like to fly and not to have to follow a path, um, but the implication is that human beings can't know what it is to be a, uh, a bird. They li we live in two different worlds. Uh, um, so uh, if, the, if the speaker fails to like, understand the bird, the poem doesn't fail, because what it captures for me in part is the, uh, the fathomless unknowability of, uh, of this bird, this creature, uh, which becomes a cipher for nature, uh, an item of impenetrable uh, enigmaticness. And there's lots of this in, in Dickinson, a sign of like the real mystery uh, and depthlessness of the world in which we're planted, maybe a sign of a human fall fallenness. Uh, in, a, in a, her modified and secularized uh, Christian world. Uh, so to, to suggest how is issues escalate, uh, I want to take another animal poem uh, that Dickinson writes. Uh, this would be poem 986 uh, on page 40 in your anthology. Uh, page 40. <clears throat> this is one of the 12 poems that was published in Dickinson's life. Uh, and I think it may have been published with the title of Snake uh, at one point, because that's what it's about, uh, as becomes clear. Um, and I w n let's stop to note that many of Dickinson's poems are about animals, perhaps because she's female. And, and uh, the connection would be that animals live outside the w of the world regulated by human activity, um, which is to say the world regulated by males. Uh, so that a, a, a kind of a, a, a sympathy or identification with other creatures that are domesticated may enter into the writing about animals. Um, there's a poet who should have been on our syllabus too, Marianne Moore. She's on page 430 in Anthology, who writes a lot of poems about animals for, I think, the same reason. They're outside the system of male control. So let me read this and uh, then comment on it. <clears throat> An arrow fellow in the grass occasionally rides. You may have met him. Did you not? His notice sudden is. The grass divides with a comb, a spotted shaft is seen, and then it closes at your feet and opens further on. He likes a boggy acre, a floor too cool for corn. Yet when a boy in barefoot, I more than once at noon have passed, I thought, a whiplash on braiding in the sun, when stooping to secure it, it wrinkled and was gone. Several of nature's people I know, and they know me. I feel for them a transport of cordiality, but never met this fellow, attended or alone, without a tighter breathing and zero at the bone. What a great last line. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, two words that are so common. Uh, we all use them, but would you ever think of putting them together? Zero at the bone. I'll get back to it. Uh, it's, like, it's like the bird poem in some ways. It begins with images that civilize or put in understandable and comfortable terms something that's outside of civilization. So uh, some of the words that uh, she uses in the opening uh, couple stanzas, fellow, rides, his notice, uh, like presenting a business card, um, um, shaft, comb, suggests grooming. I mean, these, word, these words could be put together to describe a date, a, a guy coming along in a carriage with a shaft, uh, combed hair uh, to take you out. Um, <clears throat> and this is what's in our, on our mind all the time. So, uh, now, uh, civilization and its problems, uh, dating, uh, coupling, um, these are human concerns uh, that the snake doesn't seem to uh, 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 care about. Uh, so the familiarity, of course, is undercut by the insistent thingness of the snake. Uh, uh, some readers hear a, uh, uh, an insistent hissing in the, uh, uh, the fourth line. His notice is, his notice is, uh, 
Uh, it's tricky to do things with song, uh, sound, but uh, uh, at this point, uh, the poem gets a little hair-raising. Has everybody had the experience of almost stepping on a snake? Um, you know, there are rattlesnakes up in the East Bay Hills. I took a hike up there once and, and uh, uh, was tooling along down the path, and uh, suddenly I heard a sound like uh, water being poured on a skillet and looked down. There was a brown asparagus stuck going like that. Before I knew it, I had like, moved backwards 20 yards and yelled out, Jesus. Uh, uh, and in that moment, I, I, my, uh, my brain uh, disappeared. I, couldn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't, wasn't thinking. But there are moments when you get so frightened uh, uh, that you lose track of all the biases and, uh, and preconceptions you have and are just there raw in the world. This is a moment that's uh, a kind of experience that's called the sublime in literature, uh, uh, English literature. It's the experience in which you, you encounter something so unexpected, so unpredictable, that it can't be uh, categorized or boxed in. It's the opposite of the kind of mediation that Dickens is, Dickinson is looking at. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the poem also uh, plays with some of the kind of spooky superstitions and fears that people have about snakes. Uh, the, uh, the lines, the grass divides as with a comb, a spotted shaft is seen, and then it closes at your feet and opens further on. Uh, you can imagine the, the, uh, uh, the the experience of a snake crawling through grass so you can see its track and then uh, losing track of it. Uh, how many horror movies do they have like snakes crawling between girls' legs uh, in places where snakes shouldn't go? Um, but it's, it's, it, it, the grass is closing at the person's feet here, so where did the snake go? Um, and uh, uh, at this point, the poem, uh, the poem uh, starts to explore the sublime because it moves away from boundaries, defined lines, and locales into a swamp. Uh, he likes a boggy acre, a floor too cool for corn. Well, I think corn must mean wheat. Uh, the boggy acre is a swamp. Uh, no fences, nothing gross there. It's uh, in indefinite. Uh, uh, and at the same time, the poem leaves the present and the actual and goes back in time to childhood, uh, to a time before civilization, uh, to uh, evoking a time, I think, of primitive fears and primitive attitudes, and also uh, this, uh, this personage now is barefoot, uh, which increases the vulnerability and, and menace. Uh, all, all, all the more worse if you step on a snake. Uh, and they had rattlesnakes in, in uh, New England when uh, Dickinson was alive. Uh, if you step on one with bare feet. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think the poem gets primordial in that it, it, it goes backwards in history and in social history to uh, ev uh, evoke a whole history of snakes being vilified. Think about the book of, e the, the, the book of Genesis and the Garden of Eden. And then, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen cats or dogs or horses react to snakes. They don't particularly like them either. They bristle. Uh, there's something about the snake. The, uh, the conversion of the speaker into a boy, too, uh, there's no reason why we can't assume it's a boy in the first couple stanzas, but it becomes explicitly a boy, a boy in the third stanza. It evokes a time uh, when, when, uh, when girls are, uh, are more like boys than boys. Uh, anybody who's taken a class that's dealt with sexuality or Freud knows that for Freud, there's a period of, of childhood, the first three years or so, the pre-edible period before uh, uh, boys know that they're boys or girls know that they're, they're girls, uh, before sexual identity uh, is fixed, um, when everybody is kind of uh, equally gendered. Uh, Dickinson may be going back to this part of her history. Um, but it also tells us, uh, uh, we, it, we're also reminded too that the snake is uh, a phallic menace, uh, both to boys and girls both. Um, uh, we both have to uh, uh, succumb to patriarchy in growing up. And uh, the poem starts to move uh, away from being about animals now toward humans. Uh, however, let's look at the snake, uh, the way it's described here, is symmetrically patterned like a braid uh, lying on the grass, uh, stretched out and coiled. But uh, this is a braid that's not like a necklace. It's described as a whip and a lash. And whips and lashes are both things that can suddenly strike out and hurt you uh, and sting you uh, as a result of a st sudden stinging action. Uh, they're like the snakes. And while we're here, let's notice the comb. The comb has, combs have teeth. Uh, there's a lot of hidden menace underneath the language of this poem. Lines 17 and 18 tell us that several of nature's people I know, and they know me, and that there's cordial relations. Uh, uh, and this puts us in the mind of how people are eager to domesticate nature and make it something that is not threatening. Think about pets. Uh, pets are animals that we kind of half humanize. Uh, we we call, them, call them names and talk to them. The snake is not one of these fellows. Uh, it's not in that world. The snake can in induce a zero at the bone. And think about these words, zero. Uh, what are the connotations of zero? Um, it means uh, nothing uh, and therefore resonates with the word bone, uh, the material of the skeleton to evoke death. You get bit by the right snake, you can die uh, and be reduced to zero at the bone. And of course, the, teeth, the snake's fangs and, and rattles are, are made of bony parts too. So 
we're getting an account here of like uh, what might happen if the uh, if this uh, if this meeting actually resulted in a bite. And this, the sounds of the last line zero at the bone e oh. Uh, the signs of like crying out in horror. I'm thinking of Milton's sonnet on the Waldensians here, which is full of like the sound, oh, oh, uh, a lot of uh, wailing and moaning. Um, so I would say the poem is creepy. Um, it's a bit of thing that creeps. Um, it evokes the word creepy. Um, uh, you don't get this kind of like uh, uh, shiver in Whitman. Um, um, as you do from her, uh, from this girl who's sitting alone in her room at night, um, uh, spinning out a dozen words that get under your nerves. Uh, it is a kind of witchcraft. <laughs> um, let's turn all these terms over again. Uh, metaphors work both ways. Uh, the snake is being compared to a narrow, narrow fellow in the grass. Um, but the snake is an emblem of the unpredictable menace. Uh, you never know when you go outside happy and expectant. Uh, you might meet a fellow uh, uh, and end up dead. Uh, uh, you, you've all seen Looking for Mr. Goodbar. Uh, you never know what's out there, but the terms can all be like reversed now to uh, apply to the uh, uh, human being. Snakes, snakes are dangerous and they can cause damage and hurt you, but uh, human beings can hurt too. Uh, they can be sarcastic and cutting and biting and backbiting and stinging um, and uh, can cause a kind of whiplash uh, even greater than anything a, a snake can cause. Um, uh, some of the terms here, I'm, I'm, I've lost my place. Uh, a narrow fellow in the grass. A narrow fellow is a kind of off rhyme. Uh, but we think about narrowness applied to people. To some people are narrow minded. They don't, they don't understand women who write poetry, for instance. Uh, uh, some people are prudish and follow straight and narrow. And of course, we all know that there are people who are like snakes in the grass. You can't trust them. Um, so I'm going to stop. I'm going to go on reading this poem and like reading between the lines for the rest of, uh, rest of the class. Uh, and the next class too, but I'm going to stop there because there's uh, other things to look at. I do want to point out that the, there, there's, uh, there's an, a, a greater and more acute sense of uh, animality in this poem than there is in Whitman. Uh, it's closer to like the animal, uh, which the animate, uh, the, 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 the things that are alive. Uh, the word animal comes from the Latin word anima, meaning soul. It's things that have life in them. Um, uh, souls and psyches. Uh, uh, animals and Dickinson are mysterious and beyond the realm of the human. Um, uh, and so the, the poems become these, these kind of uh, uh, intense uh, forays into the exploration of interiority and human depths. Whitman, uh, compare, compare Dickinson to Whitman, Whitman is domesticator. Everything that he runs across goes into him and becomes him uh, something to celebrate. Uh, he seems to me oblivious to the idea that there's anything truly alien out there, um, beings that he can't uh, become friends with or, or become or can't engulf, um, um, nothing that can't be domesticated. Uh, he minimizes the dark side of nature. You note hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, uh, uh, fires, uh, snakes, bugs, scorpions, or tarantulas in Dickens, uh, uh, or never a situation like one that resulted in the Donner Party uh, where people ate each other. I wish I had a piece of chalk. Uh, there's a, a, a great work of literary criticism by a man named Eric Auerbach, A-U-E-R-B-A-C-H. It's called Mimesis, uh, The Representation of Reality in Western Literature. Oh, chalk. I'm addicted to chalk. Uh, the book is Mimesis. Uh, and he basically says that uh, as, you, as you look through uh, Western literature, there are two kinds of realistic representation, one of which is represented by the example of Homer. He has an essay called Odysseus the Scar, when he tells, uh, he, he analyzes the Homer's description of the moment when Odysseus's nurse uh, washes him and, and notices he's got a scar on his thigh that identifies him to her as like the Odysseus who got uh, uh, wounded by a boar when he was young. And it's a moment of recognition. And what uh, Auerbach points out that is that moment, uh, Homer describes the scar, Odysseus the nurse, and also tells the story of the hunting party in which Odysseus went out with his friends to hunt the boar. You get descriptions of the horses, the, the warriors, the shields, the weapons, the boar, the hunt, everything is told. That's one kind of realism. The other kind that Auerbach talks about is biblical, um, a kind of realism that works with stories and parables that are bottomless and that leave us with questions. And he gives the example of the story in Genesis of Abraham's uh, sacrifice of his son Isaac. You have no idea what Abraham looks like, uh, how tall he is, what color his hair is, uh, what kind of clothing he's wearing, uh, nor, nor do you have any idea of Isaac. You don't know if there are any trees in the background, what the setting is like, but you're getting a true account of human affairs uh, 
that's uh, almost exclusively psychological and moralistic and interior. So I would place Dickens in the first, uh, the first of these kind of, I'm sorry, Whitman in the first of these two kind of categories of realism, and Dickinson in the second. Uh, and hence the power of her poems, uh, which are, uh, seem frail and slight on the surface, but once you get lost in their circuitry, uh, 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 they turn out to exercise a powerful form of witchcraft. Uh, I don't know where to go from here. We've got about 10 minutes. Uh, some uh, poems that uh, deal with her uh, status as a woman I want to talk to. And uh, one of those is a poem I passed out. Uh, Poem 1670. It used to be in the uh, uh, Norton Anthology and they took it out uh, and I, I, I was pissed because I like it. Um, the last line tells us that it's a dream and so the poem is surreal. I won't read it all but uh, I'll summarize it for you. Uh, the first stanza, she w she's in her room in winter and notices a, a pink lank and warm worm there and she doesn't like it so she ties it up and secures it and feels comfortable. Then in the next stanza, the snake starts to grow and get bigger. It be the worm becomes a snake. It gets bigger and becomes ringed with powers. Uh, and uh, in the, as, as the snake gets bigger, in the second to last stanza, she shrinks. And there's an exchange in which uh, the snake says, how fair you are. Propitiation's claw, afraid he hissed of me, no cordiality. And then uh, she, she runs. Uh, she runs from town to town to town until she ends up where she started in her own room. So uh, in, in part, of course, it's a commentary on sexual. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of a pink link, warm, 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 warm? Um, so and the fact that the poem is a, a, a dream tells us that, that Dickinson, like Whitman, is uh, growing on a kind of organic form. Uh, dreams happen when the mind surrenders control and just lets it bleed. Um, and something like that hap happens here. The poem, as usual, opens with tensions. Uh, between the winter, which is cold, and the room, which is warm. So I see that as a tension between comfort and pain, uh, which becomes associated with the snake. Um, it recurs in the jarring contrast of the, uh, the bedroom and the, uh, the giant worm. You don't want worms or snakes in your bedroom. Uh, in a place of comfort, it induces pain and discomfort, uh, alienness and strangeness. Uh, um, and the second part of the first stanza suggests that she exists in a comfortable relation with this worm because she's at, in my room, at home, secure, uh, and the snake is something neighbor, neighboring, something you can tolerate and, uh, and live with. Then uh, I connected this poem to the one before, that I read before about the snake uh, because it's about a snake. This one has creeping blood in the fourth line of the second stanza. The word creep, um, the snake is now under the skin, as in the poem before, and it also increases in size and becomes ringed with power. That's led some readers to see the snake as a kind of cobra with the head, uh, the head, head inflating as it, uh, as it uh, inflates and gets ready to strike. Uh, but ring also has associations that are, are treacherous and dangerous for women. You put on a ring and your life is over um, in one way of thinking about it. Um, so at, and hence, like, as the snake gets bigger, she shrinks. And uh, then we get this, these strange lines, how fair you are, propitiation's claw, afraid he hissed of me. No cordiality. Um, so uh, who speaks? Is it the snake? And if so, is this not like the moment in, in Genesis when uh, Eve is tempted by the serpent uh, um, who says uh, how beautiful you are, how fair you are? Um, and uh, uh, one way of interpreting these uh, words is uh, the snake is saying, are you afraid of me? Uh, don't you have any cordiality? Can't you be nice? Um, and, uh, uh, or is he saying, are you afraid of me? Um, Yes, I'm afraid. She's saying, yes, I'm afraid of your cordiality. Um, <clears throat> that, and that, that line, propitiation's claw, it's a great line. It's like the, sna it's like the snake. It starts, uh, it's two words, uh, very small, but it turns into something big, six syllables. Uh, uh, and what does it mean? Uh, to propitiate means to uh, cause to uh, be favorably inclined uh, or to win the goodwill of somebody or get, to get somebody to like you. Um, <clears throat> and the response to this uh, propitiation is seen to be a claw. Uh, wanting to be cordial or nice to guys is, uh, is uh, when we get to Virginia Woolf, we're gonna read a, a sentence in which he says, two of the most detestable things in the world are love and religion. Love is detestable in uh, the view of one of the characters in the novel because what it does is it causes women to get enslaved, um, to propitiate themselves, to surrender, uh, and to uh, give up their lives. So Dickinson's response to the uh, request to propitiate, uh, to, be, to propitiate, to be nice to guys, uh, to maybe take up with a guy, is to flee. Um, through all the towns, and where does she end up? In her bedroom, uh, where, she, uh, where she works. Um, 
Um, it may be that Dickinson is the discoverer and exponent of a truer form of freedom than Whitman. Uh, what? Being locked up in your bedroom? Uh, yes, uh, and for these reasons, you know the room, the, the word room uh, comes, is related to the German word room. The word room is related to the German word Raum, uh, which means space. Your room is your space, uh, as in I need, I need room, I need space. Uh, so uh, it, what happens if you, if you uh, uh, pursue freedom and look for room in the way that uh, Whitman or Davy Crockett or, or Daniel Boone did by going west? Um, you go west and you find space and then what do you, you, you build a little hut or a room and crawl inside of it so that you don't have to deal with all the, all the dangers and menaces and you lock yourself up uh, in your room. Um, <clears throat> So uh, that poem on uh, 657 on page 38, I dwell on possibility. Uh, she's playing on the word, uh, on words for power. Uh, the Latin word posse means to be able. It gives us the word possibility. Past, a present participle is potens. Potency. Uh, I dwell on possibility. A lot of power in this, uh, in this woman alone in her stanza or room. Um, Poem 33. Um, I think shows us that Dickinson is just as free as Whitman in her coverage. This is a poem about Eris, uh, um, <clears throat> and a new sense of uh, of, uh, of depths inside of her, her psychology. Uh, wild nights, wild nights, where I with thee. Wild nights should be our luxury. Futile the winds to a heart in port. Done with the compass. Done with the chart. Rowing in Eden. Ah, the sea, might I, but might I but more tonight in thee. Um, so uh, if you look at the meter, it's by meter. It's uh, two beats per line. Wild nights, wild nights, where I with thee, wild nights should be. Uh, and critics have pointed out that the, uh, the double beat is the beat of the heart. Uh, and the unit of this whole poem is the, the couple, the pairing. Uh, the formal feature of the poem uh, reflected in the last line is two words, two syllables. Uh, Tunis, coupling, is at the heart of this poem, whose first stanza ends up with the word luxury. Um, in the letter I passed out to Hig Hig uh, Higginson, she says that after her tutor leaves, her only companion is her lexicon. She would have known that luxury is related to the word lechery um, and to lust, um, which the poem is about. Um, and then uh, futile, the winds in the second, uh, second stanza. What's futile? Um, uh, passion? Uh, no passion, uh, what seems to be futile is passion to somebody who's uh, renounced travel uh, and companionship to somebody who's uh, in a port. And notice the word heart stands out there, capitalized in this poem that deals with double beats. Um, uh, so the tools of getting out there into the world, uh, the compass and the chart, those are what allow people to go away from home to strange, uh, strange ports. Uh, these are done, they've been put away. Um, she's not traveling, she's left herself in her room. Um, uh, without, and without rules. Uh, she travels without the chart and the compass uh, and looks for Eden, which uh, those of you who study the Bible know that Eden is the Hebrew word for pleasure. Uh, and then finally, uh, at the end, uh, in, in looking for pleasure, I think the speaker, masculine, masculine, she masculinizes the speaker um, and uh, ends with the wish, might I but more in thee, um, make of that what you will. So, but uh, I, I think her ending up in her room is like her declaration of independence. Let me just uh, uh, close on a note, uh, a note on poem 303, The Soul Selects Her Own Society, in which uh, three stanzas, she talks about the soul uh, figured as a she, selecting her own society. The poem uh, is slightly rebelling against the convention of female passivity. Uh, the females are just passive, that all they can do is feel things. If you're passive, you experience passion because you're acted on instead of acting. Um, girls are chosen, uh, uh, as women were taught in the 19th century, but they do not choose. Um, but here what she's saying is that the soul selects her own society. Um, in the first stanza, she shuts the door on the divine majority, on God. Majority can also mean like common sense or the, uh, 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 the agree agreement of the many. We, we've seen that she shuts the door on society too, the society of Amherst. In the second stanza, she notes chariots and the emperor. and. Uh, those are both uh, uh, vehicles and uh, things of the world, worldly company. She shuts the door on that too. And then in the last stanza, closes the veils of her attention. Where veils is a word that works like that phrase in Whitman, uh, the exquisite flexible doors. It can be, re it can be a, a, vaginal, um, a, a, a vaginal image. Uh, uh, she's closing herself off too to uh, 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 
marriage and human contact. Um, so uh, this is saying that, that she's made a choice. She's not, uh, not uh, relegated herself to a passive position. She's chosen to be alone as she is. Um, and the, the poem is uh, uh, complex because it's not like she's rejecting all these things. She's noticing that the divine majority, uh, the chariots, the emperors, um, they all have an appeal, um, but they're rejected. Um, she rejects both the world and the God, yet they're valued in the poem because they're contested. Um, they're worth fighting for, worth a consideration, but not as important as her independence and being alone in her room to create her work. Okay, I'll leave you on that uh, note and uh, come back to talk to you on Wednesday about Henry James.